Hi everyone, today we are finishing our tour of Newtonian dynamics with an exploration of the concepts embedded in rotational dynamics. So as we've built up our knowledge through the uh, semester so far, what we've done is we've started with the motions of point particles, then we explained why those zero-dimensional masses will move through the process of forces, then we've turned around and described how extended bodies will rotate and how they move, and now we discuss why they move. So we need the analog of forces, we need the analogs of energy, and we need the analogs of momentum uh, that we associate with our um, extended bodies undergoing rotation. So our analogies continue with the action that we have in uh, with linear uh, descriptions of motion. And here we're going to, instead of talking about the forces that lead to accelerations, we are going to introduce the topic of torque. And torque is the thing that creates angular accelerations. Uh, similarly, forces acting through distance do work, and torques acting through angular displacements also do work. We do not need a separate description of work for rotational and linear uh, motion because they are both creating energy, just rotational energy comes from the work that's done through torques acting through angular displacements. Uh, finally, just as forces over time create impulse, which then change an object's momentum, uh, those torques acting over time end up changing angular momentum. And so we're going to build up the ideas today of torque and angular momentum. We focused a bit on work and energy last time, but we'll sort of develop some of those ideas uh, uh, briefly. But we're going to focus a lot on the torques and the angular momentum. So let's get to it. Well, first off, let's define what a torque is. A torque needs a description of an angular, uh, something that creates an angular acceleration. And it turns out that that's going to depend on two things. Uh, a force is just kind of a force, but a torque actually uh, depends on how you look at a system. So a torque is going to represent how much force is applied to an object that's going to rotate, and how far from the axis of rotation that force is acting. If we think about a door or a hinge or something that rotates around a pivot point, so this object is sort of free to move here, and we exert a force on that object, uh, it's going to rotate, uh, but the weird thing about it is that only one component of the force is going to change the angular acceleration. If I have the second component here, the F cos phi, that's the Greek letter phi, that's just going to push and pull on the hinge. It's not going to actually turn this object up or down. Instead, only this component is going to matter. Similarly, if you act to bring this force into the center of the pivot point, it's just not as effective at rotating this object. This is why with doors, the handle is opposite the location of where the hinges are. It's because you can exert a force. If you've ever tried to open or close the door by just pushing right next to the hinges, you know it requires way more force to uh, push uh, that door open. So it depends on how far that force is acting from the pivot point and uh, the direction of the force relative to the direction the object can rotate. We're going to call the moment arm is the distance from the pivot point uh, where a force is being calculated or a torque is being calculated out to where that force is acting. So that's the moment arm and it is the vector uh, from the pivot to where the force acts, not the other way around, not force to pivot. It is pivot point to force. And later we'll generalize to a case where we don't even think about objects pivoting. We just consider the point at which we consider our, the torque, the origin of the torque. So it starts there and goes to wherever the force is acting on an extended object. We define a torque mathematically in uh, a vector form is torque is the moment arm as a vector cross product with the force, uh, F. So R cross F is the force. Order matters. More on that in a second. 
Uh, we can consider the magnitude of a torque here, and we'll just use that as a single letter uh, tau, which is the moment arm, length of the moment arm, times the force times the sine of the angle between those two vectors when they are slid over and placed tail to tail. So if I have a pirate wheel here, and I consider uh, that you used to steer pirate ships, this is the moment arm here, R comes out. The force is acting, or sort of spinning the, pirate's, uh, steer, uh, the pirate ship's steering wheel. To calculate the angle between them, I take this force F, and I slide it down so that it is tail to tail, and that's the angle that we uh, calculate. So that gives us our angle and our definition of these two, even though the force and the moment arm will have kind of a tip to tail relationship, put those tails together to figure out the angle between them. Okay, we are going to also often focus on a two dimensional object or sort of a one, like we're kind of look at a system from the top down in which case we are going to end up defining uh, the torques as if we are looking down on those objects along the, plot, the, plus, the positive Z axis. And so that means we're going to give some signs to the torques. And if we're looking down along the positive Z axis, that means that when an object is rotating counterclockwise, we're going to give that a positive torque, kind of in the mathematics sense, measured from x equals zero line in the counterclockwise direction. That sense of angle, we're going to give that the direction and call that positive torque. Similarly, negative torques are going to operate uh, clockwise. So if I have this axis system here, x and y, in this case, the Z axis is going to be coming out of the plane of the screen towards you, poke you right in the eye. So watch out for that Z axis right there. Uh, and that is, and when we're looking down on that, counterclockwise torques will be positive and clockwise torques will be negative. So let's think about how to find the net torque around this axle O if we have uh, kind of a two, uh, sort of two axes, uh, two axles, uh, where we have an inner radius and we have an outer radius here. And we have one force that's acting on the inner radius, and then these two forces here are on the outer radius. So we just calculate the net torque by adding up the, net, uh, the individual torques all together. So we can just uh, calculate. I'll start out here and call this torque right here. This is going to be tau 1. And tau 1 is going to have a uh, magnitude that is going to be, uh, we'll go, I think we'll need a little room. So tau 1 is equal to RF sine of the angle between them. As I've defined it, it is acting a distance of A from the center of the uh, axis. It's spinning around here and it is going in the clockwise direction. So we're going to say torque number one is going to be equal to negative A, or let's put in some numbers here. So it's going to be negative. The axis here is one meter, and then the force on that is going to be nine newtons, and it is, the angle between these two vectors is going to be 90 degrees, sine of 90 degrees, and you can see that if I imagine constructing this axis right here, heading out from the pivot point out to where the force is acting on it, the, and then I slid this vector over so it uh, lined up tail to tail. I think I can actually do the sliding. Yeah, there we are, like that. Then it is going to have a 90 degree angle between them. And so sine of 90 is one. And so this is going to create a torque around this axis of negative nine Newton meters. Next, let's do this uh, force up here as creating torque two. So in that case, tau two is equal to R. Well, R is larger now. R goes from zero out here and is gonna have a length of B. So that radius is going to be two two meters times the force, which is 10 newtons, 
Again, it's acting perpendicular to the moment arm, so that's going to be a sine of 90 degrees, and it's acting in the clockwise direction, so that means it's going to be negative. So this is going to be negative 20 newton meters. Next, and last, is tor uh, torque 3, and so tau 3 is not acting at a 90 degree angle, which makes this, you know, slightly complicated. And so what we need to do is figure out the angle that it is acting. So if I think about that one, I have a moment arm that goes out like this uh, here. And then I can uh, go ahead and lasso that and sort of put those vectors tail to tail like so. And there's going to be a nice 90 degree angle here of which this angle is 30 degrees, so this will be 60 degrees. So we have that the torque there is going to be 1 meter times 12 newtons times the sine of 60 degrees, and it's going to be acting in the positive direction. And so that's going to be equal to plus 10.39 newton meters. And if I add up tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau 3, I'm going to get that that's minus 18.6 newton meters. So that's how we calculate some torques given there. You know, there's a lot of sliding vectors and figuring out angles between them. I keep saying the unit newton meters, and uh, that's kind of an uh, interesting idea. Dia, it sort of falls out of the equation here. It's, you know, moment arm is in meters, uh, force is in newtons, and angle, the sign, has no units. So it's a newton time a meter, but it's also a joule, right? Because uh, a newton times a meter has the same units of joules. This is just kind of a coincidence of being a force times a distance here. We usually keep this distinct in our head by calling the units of torque newton meters and then calling the units of energy joules because they are not the same concept. So I'll be kind of particular and say, oh, it's just the newton meter. Um, it's kind of shows up in similar mechanics. Uh, torque is the uh, component of the force that's perpendicular to a moment arm. Uh, work is kind of projection in the parallel direction. So these end up being very distinct concepts. Uh, it's neat to know uh, if you are an automotive aficionado, you sometimes will hear engines as providing a certain amount of foot pounds of torque. It's the same idea. It's a moment arm times a force. Uh, and so those, that's kind of the imperial unit for torque is a foot pound. And because we live in North America, uh, that makes the units come out in uh, the imperial uh, values when you're describing engines. Don't even get me started on horsepower again. Anyways, so foot pounds of torque, uh, newton meters of torque, we leave these as distinct units. Now, much like uh, other th things like potential energies uh, or uh, kinetic energies, these depend on your choices of origin. But the um, description here for the torque is quite physically meaningful. Potential energy is less important, but kinetic energy depends on your frame of reference. Uh, torque also depends on the specified axis. So the torque is always has to refer to the torque with respect to a specified axis. And usually we're going to pick the axis around which the object is rotating. Sometimes we'll have some more freedom, which we can abuse to our advantage. So coming back, uh, it's worth remembering that torque is a cross product of a force uh, of a moment arm times the force. And so we should remember some key properties of the uh, torque vector. Uh, first is we get our direction by using the right hand rule. You put your hand out along the moment arm and then you uh, turn your hand in the direction of the force and then your thumb will point in the direction of the torque. Uh, cross products, please remember, are anti-commutative, so that means order matters. So R cross F is not F cross R. Uh, we can distribute the uh, cross product, so A cross B plus D is A cross B plus A cross C. Uh, and then 
as we'll find out a little later, we can take this under a product rule by saying that uh, the time derivative of A cross B, this is the new one, is we just apply the product rule and keep the cross product in between. Time derivative of A cross B, and then A plus A cross the time derivative of B. Product rule. We uh, also know that if A and B are parallel, we the uh, angle between them is zero, uh, so the sine theta the term is zero, and so A cross B will also be zero. Similarly, if they're perpendicular, then the magnitude of A cross B is just going to be the magnitude of A times B, and that sine phi term is going to be equal to sine 90, which comes out to be one, hence we get AB. So let's remember these math facts as we plow off across uh, various directions. So first off, we can absolutely just calculate a uh, cross product based torque. I can give you a force with unit vectors and a torque or a moment arm um, uh, that is given by a displacement. We'd like to calculate the torque exerted, exerted by a certain force on a ball that's a certain displacement measured relative to the coordinate axes. So this is asking us secretly calculate what R cross F is. Tau is equal to R cross F. Well, in this case, we have uh, the, just a cross product, so we can use this uh, method of Ceres uh, that I like to use for cross products. You can remember it any way you like. Uh, I'm going to write this down. Uh, and then the first thing I write down is the row of for R. And then I wrote down, write down the components for F in terms of the unit vectors. So R is uh, units of minus 1J plus 5K. So its ith component is 0. Its jth component is negative 1. And then its kth component is 5. And then the force is just going to be uh, 3 in the i direction minus two in the j direction, and zero in the k direction. And then what we do is we write down ij again. We repeat the entries underneath them, minus one, minus two. And then we calculate the positive components by multiplying uh, those three uh, things together and adding them up. So this is uh, minus one times zero times i hat, zero, uh, plus 15 j hat plus 0 k hat. Then we come back and go the other direction and ascribe negative signs to those products. So we do these diagonals uh, going back in that direction. And so then we get that this is, uh, we, we add plus, uh, or sorry, I should say we subtract, we do minus, and then this is negative one time, oh, sorry, uh, uh, negative one times three times k hat. So that's negative three, and then there's the negative in front. So that gets us to become plus three k hat. And then we do negative two times five times i hat, uh, and then we subtract that. So it's plus 10 uh, i hat. And then we have uh, 0 times 0 times j hat, and that's just 0. So then we collect like terms, uh, get some cancellations, cancel, cancel, and then we find out what we got. We got uh, the torque is equal to 10i uh, plus 15j plus 3k newton meters. So if we need to calculate vector torques and we have units in components, we just calculate the cross product that way. Uh, we're going to mostly rely on the RF sine phi construction and the right-hand rule, uh, but it's good to know that we can do this from arbitrary unit vectors. Okay, moving right along. Torques create angular accelerations. And the uh, way we can sort of see this is imagine a particle on a circular trajectory that is kind of held together there by the normal force, or a, sorry, a force that is creating a normal direction acceleration of magnitude uh, v squared over r. And then the tangential component there is going to be the thing that accelerates it. 
Uh, so if we think about this thing that's creating the angular acceleration, I just want to note first off that the torque from the normal direction force is zero. Uh, so there is no torque from that. And so we only consider the torque for the tangential direction force. And if we think about that, this little particle here is being pushed on uh, by some net force. So it experiences an acceleration m times a t. So the tangential component of the acceleration is uh, but from the sum of the forces in the tangent direction. Now, uh, let's consider this in terms of magnitude. Well, we see if we take this expression up here and multiply both sides by r, uh, you notice that r times f sub t is the torque. And then that's m times the tangential acceleration times r. And then we'll rewrite the tangential acceleration as r times the angular acceleration, kind of undoing what we usually do. And then we'll collect our r's and we get m r squared alpha. And then the uh, clever person will note that, wait, m r squared? That's something we've seen before. Well, that's the moment of inertia. And so then we end up with an expression that says that the sum of the torques is equal to mr squared, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration. And we can write down this for a bunch of objects acting in a rigid body or in a rigid body. And we get that the sum of torques is i times alpha for an extended system by generalizing a point particle. And the rule that we've learned is that by counting for things at, uh, under this moment of inertia, adding up mr squared over a distributed body, we get the right component. So this is neat because it gives us our analog of Newton's second law. We have the sum of the forces or the sum of the torques. Uh, so torques are like masses or torques are like forces. That's the actual word. The moment of inertia is the equivalent of a mass and sort of like a mass. And then alpha, the angular acceleration, is the equivalent of a linear acceleration. So this is F equals MA, just angular style. Well, let's actually do a little bit of an application here. So a solid cylindrical axis with uh, M and R as specified in a car is subject to 300 Newton meters of torque. Uh, if it starts at rest, how fast is it rotating after two seconds? Well, we know uh, that the sum of the torques, sum of torques is equal to I times alpha. And we'd like to figure out uh, that uh, there's only a single torque. So this is just says that uh, sum of I alpha is equal to torques. I'd like to know the angular acceleration, and that's the torque over the moment of inertia. And then if I want to figure out it's a constant torque, so constant angular acceleration, then the uh, angular speed at a certain time is the initial speed plus alpha times T. And that is going to be just equal to tau over the moment of inertia, torque over inertia times time. And that's because the initial angular speed is zero. So we are happy to just stick in our torque, uh, which is 300 newtons per meter, or 300 newton meters, it's not a spring, divided by the moment of inertia, which is one half mr squared. So I should note that up here, i is a half mr squared for a solid cylinder. That's where that comes from. So we get a half times 100 kilograms times the radius, which is 0 0.05 meters quantity squared times the time, which is two seconds. And if I put it all in, I get an answer of 4,800 radians per second. So that gives us uh, all the pieces that we need uh, to solve a simple F equals MA problem. To solve these hmm, interesting problems, we're going to follow a few basic tips. First, we just set the sum of forces equal to zero. Draw a free body diagram, solve the forces uh, to be equal to zero. Then pick a point somewhere to calculate the torques around. It doesn't matter. It's not rotating, so you can pick any point in the system 
to calculate your torques for. And so, much like, say, the zero point of energy, we want to pick something that makes our math easy because we should be lazy. And so that means we look for cases where we have unknown or complicated or a lot of forces and pick that as your pivot point. Then the moment arms are zero and none of those torques matter. So it's fantastic. You can even pick two different points and the torques are going to be zero on both of them if you need different systems of equation. Then set the sum torques equal to zero and hope you get closed systems of equations. Let's give it a try. Well, Here's a piggy bank. Uh, it is suspended on a rope here from a little uh, system. There's a massive rod here, has some force uh, acting on it. And it's uh, going to, you know, it's attached to the wall with a hinge so it can kind of flip up and down. Then there's like a little uh, knob up top and this cable is attached uh, here. And what we want to do is understand what's the ta uh, cable tension that keeps the system in static equilibrium uh, so that the PE bank does not sort of fall down and the hinge doesn't slide around or anything like that. So we can write down what the uh, forces on this system are. So we can simply say the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So we write down the forces on, and I'd say the th object that we want to consider here is the rod. So we'll focus on the rod. And uh, when we look at this, we're going to see that the forces on this are going to be, okay, I picked the rod because it's kind of the central object in the system. And if it doesn't move, then nothing else is going to move. And so we can look at this to see if we can pull out a um, set of equations. So let's get a free body diagram. So the forces on the rod, well, we've got some hinge force actually don't really know what the hinge is doing so it's probably keeping it up or down uh, let's say it keeps it suspended that's probably it we don't know seems complicated looks like it's a candidate for trying to ignore <laughs> uh, we've got a uh, weight from the rod itself so this is mass of the rod times g that'll act right here at the center of mass so m r times g is a force that's pulling down and uh gravitational forces act at the center of mass uh in the uniform gravitational field but let's work with that uh so the they pull down at the center of mass for the system uh we have the cable force so this is going to be uh t we'll call that the tension cable uh in the cable there uh we also have the case that the uh um, we have a tension force, we'll call this from the cable. We also have a tension force from the rope that's pulling down, TR. And so that's going to set up a, a bunch of forces on this system. And ooh, I bet you that that hinge force is a little more complicated because as I've drawn it, this whole thing is uh, complicated. And so that hinge force must actually be pointing off, not exactly up the wall, but yeah, it's kind of got to go off in this direction. F hinge. It's not how you spell hinge. We'll just call it F H because yeah, H is for hinge. Uh, at this point, looks kind of like uh, a system we can solve. We hope we get out some equations from it. What we want to do is then calculate the sum of the torques. And as I've been kind of leading into here, we don't know a ton about the system uh, and what this hinge force is doing. So we're going to pick a pivot point right here. So pick this pivot. And the reason why we pick that pivot is we don't know what the hinge force is doing. Uh, we have figured it out, and we just want to calculate the torques around it. Please, why don't you let us calculate the torques around this uh, system? So we're going to pick that there so that there is no torque from the hinge force. But there is, there are torques from the other three forces. So first off, we know that the tension in the cable is acting at a distance L from the pivot. So we write down T times L. Uh, it's acting in the counterclockwise direction, so that means it's going to be positive. 
and it's going to be pulling off in that direction. Uh, so that cable is pulling in towards the wall. And so the tension uh, times L, and then we have to figure out the angle between them. So if we imagine the moment arm here, um, we sketch in the actual moment arm as a vector that looks like this. So it goes on up here. There's my moment arm vector. I am going to do that same trick where I'm going to lasso just it, I hope. Yeah, there we are. Yeah. I'm going to pull it up here. And then I'm going to, well, annotate it with a little vector head. And I'll just note that the angle between the cable here and the moment arm is going to be equal to the 180 degrees minus theta. This is a straight line, supplementary angles. So then uh, I can take all that away, pop my uh, vector back down, and I will see that my moment arm there is going to be sine of 180 degrees minus theta. So that's the torque from the cable, so T sub C. Then we have to put in the torque from the piggy bank. Uh, so we're going to say that that's minus T times R, also acting at a length L. And then if we uh, grab our vector there, we can pull the vector. We can pull the vector up here, take a look at it, and we see that the angle between that one here is going to be equal to, well, let's construct a little helper line right here. And we'll see that this theta is a vertical angle with that theta, and that's a 90 degrees, so this must be, overall, the angle between them is going to be equal to 90 degrees plus theta. So we are good. So great. Uh, so let's pop that moment arm back down there. Actually, let's take, pop that moment arm over there, get rid of it. We're done with it. Uh, the thing that we need to remember is that this has an angle between them of sine of 90 degrees plus theta. Uh, finally, we have the torque from the weight. It has the same angle that the rope is pulling down because they're both pulling downward. And so that's minus M of the rod, or yeah, M, which is big M, times G. It's acting at a length L over two, and it's acting at an angle of sine of 90 degrees plus theta. So we're, we're basically set. Um, we also know that because the piggy bank is in static equilibrium, it has a free body diagram that looks like T, and then uh, T of the rope balances with the little m times G. So that means that T sub R I can replace up here with M uh, G, and that gives me my expressions that I need, and of course we're in static land. So this must be zero. Great. And you'll notice that we know everything in this equation except for the variable that we seek, which is uh, the tension force. So let's uh, solve for it. So we get that T in the cable times L times sine of 180. That's actually just sine. Uh, 1A minus theta is sine theta, trig identity power. And then we'll push the other two terms to the other side, which is MG times L, and sine of 90 plus theta is actually a cos of theta, plus big M G L over 2 cos theta, and we'll go ahead and we'll cancel out our L's, cancel, 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 and solve for TC uh, by dropping the sine theta underneath, so that gives us that the tension in the cable is equal to M G cos theta uh, plus mg, big mg over 2, cos theta, all divided by sine theta. Now we can plug in some numbers uh, to get the desired value here, uh, which will be m, a little m, is equal to 5 kilograms, times g, which is 10 meters per second squared, honest, uh, cos of 30 is root 3 over 2, 
plus big M, which is the rod's mass, 2 kilograms, also times 10 meters per second squared. Uh, and that is uh, divided by 2 times, again, the cos 30, root 3 over 2, all divided by sine uh, theta, which is a half. And then it's calculator time. That's 104 newtons. Calculator power. So statics is just the beginning. Um, dynamics is uh, actually when things leave the case where forces and torques sum to zero. And then we get into the case where the body uh, bodies are in motion and uh, they start to care about both the translation and the rotational dynamics. And one of the themes that I want to highlight through this section is that a given force in a problem will provide both a acceleration and acceleration and a torque. You end up thinking you're double counting things, but it's not. It does both things. And that allows us to solve some problems under the action of uh, the combined action of a force providing both torques and providing forces. Uh, we want to consider the first the case of rolling motion. And rolling motion means that what, what you see when an object is rolling along and is in contact with the ground at a certain point. So that point uh, is going to have zero velocity with respect to the ground. And that comes from like when a tire is rolling along, it's not moving or sliding against the surface. It comes down, touches the surface, and then lifts back up, kind of also how feet work. Um, and so what's happening here is that we have a, speci uh, a specified relationship between the angular velocity of a rolling object and the velocity of the center of mass so that the tangent velocity of that motion is zero here. And so as this wheel rolls uh, across uh, this uh, green expanse here, we always have the point that's in contact with the ground is going to have zero uh, tangential velocity with respect to the Earth. This leads to kind of a peculiar motion. So if you watch a uh, point on the rim of a motion, this is a old uh, stop motion uh, photograph of a rolling object that has a little card that's been attached to the edge of it. And it traces out this weird pattern uh, that's called a cycloid. And that's because it comes down, it touches the ground, and then it goes fast over the top. And you'll notice that the spacing between these kind of decreases, and then it slows down. So it's this weird motion of what a single point on a rolling wheel looks like. And that arises from two di uh, a combination of two pieces of motion. So a rolling wheel has translational and rotational velocities. And if we think about that the vector sum of what happens if a round object is moving off in one direction and it has some velocity vectors and they're all the same and they're all going in one direction here. The object is also rotating and so that means if it's rotating around its center of mass it's going to be spinning here and there's no additional motion at the center. And then we just add vectors. Let's slide these two together and consider their vectors. Well, First off, uh, at the center, there's no rotational motion. So the center of mass moves along with the translational speed uh, there. If we look at the motion at the top of the wheel, the translation and the rotation vectors line up. And so it's moving twice as fast along the top of the wheel. If we look at the rotational vector at the bottom, the translation is going that way, and then rotation is pushing back in the other direction, and so that balances out. So we get our desired v equals zero at the bottom, and then these other vectors are adding at 90 degree angles, and so you get resultants that are pointing off in different directions, showing you the velocity vectors of every individual point on this wheel.
So even though the wheel is moving forward at a constant velocity, the points on the rim are doing very strange motion, like so. Uh, and so they combine. And so you get that the top of the wheel moves fast, and then it slows down and to zero when it comes into contact with the ground and executes this uh, cycloid motion as we're going. But specifically, we get the relationship that this only works if the rotation speed is going to have the same magnitude as the velocity of the center of mass at the edge of the wheel. So we require v equals r omega uh, to, for this rolling motion to work. And so we get problems like this. What is the angular speed of a car tire for a vehicle that is traveling at 30 meters per second if the radius of the car tire is 30 centimeters? This is just saying if you're rolling without slipping, then the velocity of the center of mass of the wheel must be equal to r times omega. Therefore, omega must be equal to v over r, and that is just 30 meters per second over the radius, which is 0 0.3 meters. And so that's 100 radians per second. As long as that holds, the wheel is not slipping on the ground. And so we get uh, rolling without slipping as it moves along. Uh, I think that's a lot of examples. Goes through uh, this in all the different flavors that we can see. Uh, I will note that um, we can consider the rotational work acting on a system. And we think about the incremental bit of linear work that's done on a rotating system as the force dotted with a tiny little step in the uh, in direction, which we'll sort of treat as linear, so f dot ds. But for a rotating system, that can just be the tangential force that's moving in that sort of uh, small increment ds. And that little bit of arc we will write as r d theta. And then you'll notice that this f times t or ft times r is equal to the torque times d theta. And so then we can integrate this expression up through this tiny little bit, add them all up, and we get a work, which is the integral from one angle to the next of a torque through the angle. And so then uh, we can finally uh, also make the note uh, that this torque is equal to i alpha. And so then we can write down the integral of i alpha uh, d theta and so that is uh, this integral, i alpha d theta. I'll rewrite the alpha part here as d omega by dt. It's the definition of alpha. And then engage in a little bit of uh, change of variables by considering d theta by dt and d omega d theta. So basically do a uh, sort of chain rule expansion. Uh, we know that the product of these two derivatives is going to get back to d omega by dt by the chain rule. But then we recognize that d theta by dt here, why, why that's omega. And then the integral of d omega by d theta, uh, that's just the integral of d omega. So this is integral of i omega d omega, which is 1 half i omega squared. And that's the change in rotational kinetic energy. We used an exactly similar formula by using the VDV equals ADS relationship in linear. Uh, this is the same reasoning just applied in angular coordinates. So that's all I'm going to say about rotational work. We have a work energy theorem. It's well developed. Um, I'd like to now turn to the uh, relationships for energy. And uh, we'll start, or for momentum. And we're going to start out with the scalar version of the angular momentum problem. Uh, and we'll define angular momentum as basically mass times velocity, but using the analogs of rotational uh, products. So mass becomes moment of inertia i. Omega is the velocity. So we're going to define an angular momentum with a vector or with letter L as the uh, angular momentum. And we're going to use the same sign convention before. Positive is going to be counterclockwise rotation. And so this kind of follows the idea of a point particle moving around in circular motion. Uh, in that case, it's going to have a momentum that's equal to m times v. And if I take that mv, p is equal to mv, and I end up multiplying that by r, I'm going to recognize that that angular momentum l is uh, going to be m 
times r squared times omega using this definition here. And I'll put one of those r's onto the omega and uh, it becomes mvr in circular motion. So we're able to kind of recognize that a particle moving around on a circular orbit is going to have angular momentum mvr, and that's the equivalent of i omega. So this seems like a good, workable, consistent definition. Uh, we're going to formally bring in the vector power and note that L is going to be R cross P, just like torque is R cross F, the R always comes first. And so that uh, is the vector angular momentum fixed. And then this vector angular momentum is also L uh, for a rigid rotating object is the moment of inertia times omega uh, as a vector. Moreover, we can uh, take the time derivative of r cross p and apply that product rule to say that this is uh, dr by dt cross p and then r times dp by dt. Now notice that uh, dr by dt is v, that's the velocity vector, and we're going to cross product it with the momentum vector, and that particular term goes to zero because anything crossed with a vector parallel to itself is zero. The other term is going to be uh, the r times dp by dt, but Newton's second law tells us that that is the net force, and so r cross f is the torque. So we have derived that the time change in an angular momentum is the vector torque uh, on the system. So this holds for any system of particles as long as all their internal forces are going to act along lines between them. So their relative moment arms are aligned with the forces and those go to zero, which is most things. Most rigid uh, bodies are having forces that act along uh, the lines between the individual particles. And that allows us to say just for uh, linear particle or uh, rigid systems as a whole, we can apply this version of the rotational version of Newton's second law. So let's actually uh, think about how to apply this. Well, first off, much like collisions and other cases, if we have no net torques, then we have a conservation law. The angular momentum of a system is uh, conserved. And this is you know, useful in a lot of things. Things keep on spinning, but it's also very helpful in cases where you have kind of radial motion in uh, a circular system, because then there is no change in the um, no change in the actual angular momentum, and there's no torques because all the forces are acting along the moment arms to like pull things in or push things out. And these are often cases where we can really get a handle on there being a conservation of angular momentum. So uh, let's think about this in this case. So we think about a playground merry-go-round that's spinning without friction once every five seconds. And the merry-go-round is a disc with a mass of 100 kilograms and radius of two meters. And a kid walks from the center out to the edge of the spinning merry-go-round. And we'd like to know what the rotational period of the, of, of the system is after the, after the kid walks out. So the way we do that is we uh, consider this at the beginning to say, okay, there are no net torques on the system. So sum of torques is zero, and so L, which is equal to I omega, is a constant. So that means we can write down the moment of inertia before and the angular speed before is equal to the moment of inertia after times the speed, uh, angular speed after. The moment of inertia before is one half m r squared and then this is 2 pi over the initial rotation period, t initial, r, uh, yeah. And then afterward, the moment of inertia is the same thing, 1 half m r squared, but there's now a small particle on the edge, so we say that's plus little m r squared, new moment of inertia, it times 2 pi over t final. So then we can solve for t final. We will do some uh, cancellating here, and we will get that the uh, new angular period, t final, is equal to t initial uh, times a half m r squared plus little m r squared all over one half m r squared 
or t initial times uh, looks like uh, 1 plus 2 little m over big M, which is equal to 5 seconds times 1 plus 2 times 30 kilograms over 100 kilograms, and that comes out to 8 seconds. So we took this, you know, this is basically changing moment of inertia because it's purely radial forces. They exert no torques. Therefore, uh, some of the torques is zero. Now, what's weird is that particles moving in a straight line also have an angular momentum, but it's specified with respect to an observer. And so if you think about this observer here in red, watching a particle go by, in um, uh, moving along with velocity vectors v here shown here in blue and a moment arm of that radius r there's going to be a moment of inertia so the angular momentum is i times omega and if we think about the omega that is going to be just the perpendicular component of the velocity it's going to make it appear like this uh body or this part black particle is moving around and you're changing angle on it so it's going to have an angular momentum and the magnitude of that angular momentum and we're going to write this as mr squared so r squared times m mr squared times omega and that's just the perpendicular velocity component over this radius so that is going to be the apparent angular speed and then we're going to cancel out one of the r's and we'll note that v perpendicular is v times the sine of this angle between uh, r and uh, v here. So I always like to uh, showcase that this r sine theta is actually just this perpendicular distance here as well. So we can sort of think about this as just m r v times whatever the speed is projected perpendicular uh, to the uh, line of sight. So at the minimum distance is when the angular speed is the largest, and we can kind of figure out what that uh, component is for a given angle theta. Uh, so as an example, uh, I like to run across the classroom at a fairly pokey speed of seven meters per second. And so you can actually calculate what my angular momentum is as just saying, oh, this is my mass times V times R. And if we're off at some angle, we're gonna consider sine theta to be 90, uh, which is directly in front of someone in the front row, uh, say they're four meters away, and you just calculate the angular momentum based on this distance here, how fast I'm traveling, and how big I am. Now, this means that uh, different observers are going to see different angular momentum for a given particle. And this is analogous to how you have different momentum depending on your inertial, what inertial frame of reference you're in. So this is going to matter that you actually have to pick an origin and figure out what your angular momentum is. Angular momentum does come with this vector nature. And we're not going to dive into too much detail about it here, but we'll wait until we're in class and can really see some angular momentum vectors in action. But I will note that since torque is the time derivative of the angular momentum, uh, and that torque may not point in the same direction as the angular momentum, then you can actually have the torque changing the direction of the angular momentum. And this is often seen in a phenomenon of gyroscopes, which is there's this big spinning mass here and it creates a angular momentum vector out along its axis, right hand rule, where it spins, out it goes along the axis. And then if something is creating a torque that is not aligned with that angular momentum, it may not make it larger or smaller, but it may just change its direction, leading to this phenomenon called precession, where the gyroscope will just kind of roll around here because the torque and the angular momentum are not aligned with each other. So stay tuned. I just want to bank this fact, and then we'll come back and analyze it when we have a gyroscope that we can actually literally see in action. So that brings us to the end of rotational dynamics and to the end of Newtonian dynamics. So we're going to explore a lot of these topics as we go forward uh, and kind of bring all of this stuff together. Then we're going to ask what happens when everything that I told you starts to break down. But that's a story for a later time. For right now, let's uh, go and explore how things turn.